changing nature of the English language, using needs analysis to define the types of reading required for different academic tasks. In our journey of elevation through education, we are subject to many academic tasks. Therefore, it is important to strategize how you will deliver your work on time. Hence, this topic will teach you how. So pay your fullest attention and ask as many questions as you can. With much admiration and excitement, let me now introduce your guest speakers. Professor Angela Mayes Terzik has a PhD and MA in Applied Linguistics from York University in Toronto, Canada. She is a professor of TESOL EAP and writing at Fanshawe College in London, Ontario, Canada. She coordinates the TESOL Graduate Certificate Program and sits on two committees for TESL Ontario, the provincial governing body. She regularly presents at local, provincial, and international conferences and has published several journal articles. Her research interests are discourse processing, reading to write, EAP, and needs analysis. Dr. Hashin Abesena is an ELT professional for more than 10 years. She read for her doctoral studies at the Deakin University, Melbourne, Australia. She's completed her bachelor's and master's at the University of Kalania, Sri Lanka, and a postgraduate diploma in education at the University of Colombo. She's a Cambridge CELTA qualified ELT expert and currently working for TAFE SA in Adelaide, Australia as an academic. She's worked as a research assistant and project officer for Deakin University and has disseminated her research findings to several international publications and conferences. Her research interests include language acquisition and second language learning, applied linguistics, standards, and varieties of English and teacher education. On that note, I first invite Professor Angela to take it over from here. All right, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for inviting me. And good morning, Ms. Angela. Thank you. Let's begin. Uh, so this is my intellectual property. I'm going to talk about the types of reading, um, as well as the cognitive processes that are involved with that. We'll talk about um, needs analysis, uh, definition considerations of doing a needs analysis. Uh, then we'll talk about the pedagogical implications, and there will be time for question and answers. Oh, I need to mask again. There we go. All right, so reading comprehension. Now I know all of you have talked about reading and you've taken courses. So I will go through this fairly quickly. Um, Frishal, if people have questions in the chat box, um, please feel free to interrupt me. I'm quite comfortable with that. All right, so some major theories that we know about reading. Uh, we have what's called bottom up and top down. So bottom-up reading um, is the lower level processes. It's essentially, it's going from letters to sounds to words. Um, it's very linguistic. You're essentially just translating the symbols on the page to their coordinating words. Uh, it's very text driven. You're not doing anything else other than reading the text. When you read from a top down perspective, you're actually taking what you know about the topic not just the words and the language, um, and you're applying it to the text. So this is when you start to predict what's coming next. You question the text. Uh, what is the purpose of this author's writing? So while you're still absolutely decoding, you're actually thinking about it from your own perspective. Uh, so those were very prominent theories years and years ago. Um, and they were separate. Current cognitive processing theories of reading, uh, they've integrated both of them. So we know that most readers are doing both bottom up and top down at the same time. Um, this is true for listening as well, but we're gonna focus on reading. Um, so we combine our world, so the stuff that I know just about the world um, and our linguistic knowledge, right? So. If your linguistic level is at a lower level than the text, you're not gonna be able to read it even if you know a lot about the topic. You still have to have that linguistic knowledge. 
So if it's at your level, then you're going to be applying both. So we've known since the 90s that reading purpose or task affects what you're, what's going on in your brain, what you're thinking as you're reading, um, as well as the speed at which you're reading. So Carver in 97 said there are five types of reading. This has been expanded on, but most of it is based on this. So we know that people scan. So when you look at a text and you're looking for very specific pieces of information. So for example, if you're writing a test and the question is what year did this happen? You're looking at the text and your eyes are focusing just on numbers, right? You're looking for a year. You're not actually taking in much of the information in the text. You're just looking for a specific piece of information. So what's going on in your brain is you're essentially just looking for lexical or word recognition. Again, you're not reading as most of us think of reading. And then there's skimming. So skimming, uh, this is the process by which you read pieces of a text and you're trying to get the basic idea of the text. You don't necessarily need to know or want to know any of the supports or details or the middle stuff, you just kind of want to know what it's about in general. And when you're doing skimming, you are getting lexical access plus semantic encoding. Um, so you are doing a little bit more with your brain. So you're looking for words, but you're still put, you're putting those words together and trying to get an idea of meaning. As you can see, the rate of words per minute decreases. So scanning is really quick. You're just looking at a bunch of words, about 600 per minute. These numbers come from first language undergraduate students in the USA, by the way. At skimming, you're at about 450 words per minute in your first language. Rotting is the most common type of reading. This is when you read the newspaper in the morning, um, when you're reading something online, and you're actually interested in the topic and you want to know most of the information, uh, but you don't care if you forget it tomorrow. You're going to remember bits and pieces, but you don't need to know the whole text. So you're looking for words, you're looking for words together and their meaning, and then you're taking chunks of language and you're actually attaching them. So sentence A followed by sentence B, how do those meanings attach? And again, as you can see, what more going on in your brain, the slower your reading rate. Learning, this is the most common that we do in school. Right? I expect you to read a text and I expect you to be able to talk about it several weeks later and with a lot of thought behind it and you can regurgitate it, but not necessarily with the same words. You can actually tell me in your own words what the text was about. So we've got all of these and then we're also remembering ideas. And that's at about 200 words a minute in your first language. Memorizing is a different process in that it's very, very slow. This does not include idea remembering. What you're trying to do is remember the specific words. We also know that you can memorize a text and not have any idea what it says. So at memorizing, you're looking for the words and then you're just rehearsing the facts. So basically we're gonna be focusing on learning to read today. So after 40, 50 years of researching reading, uh, Profeti and Stafora did a very comprehensive review of the literature and the data, and they came up with the reading systems framework. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but essentially as you are reading something, this is what's going on in your brain. Reading is exceptionally complex. All of these things have to work together um, for you to understand. So what we're going to focus on is the comprehension process. So clearly you need to know all of these things, the linguistic system, the orthographics, the units, phonology, the lexicon, et cetera. But we're going to assume you have all those things for the text. When we want you to understand it, you're, there's two, level, two main levels of understanding that we're going to focus on, text representation and the situation model. Both of these things, as you can see I've highlighted here, require things called inferences. 
which I will get to, but they're very, very important for the different types of reading um, and reading to write. So the text base and situation base comes from um, cognitive psychology research. Um, Kinch, 1998, uh, built on work that he did with Van Dyke earlier. So he said there's three types of reading, the parser, which we're not going to talk about, but text-based level and a situation model. When we are reading for a text-based model, so when we're reading to, it's essentially we're understanding the text. So when we're talking about academic texts that are not um, just sentences by themselves, we're talking about adults, longer texts, so books, novels, academic articles, etc. As you read, you are actually mentally constructing the hierarchy of the text. So you know what is a main idea. Uh, you know if something is a major or minor support. You know what it's attached to. And as you're reading the text, you're doing this. So you read the first paragraph. OK, there's the thesis statement. You go to the second paragraph, and you're reading it to understand the paragraph, but you're also mentally attaching it to the first paragraph. So this is clearly quite involved. And as you're doing this, you are simply looking for what the author is telling you. So you're, be, you're able to recall. So you're still learning, but you're only able to summarize. Okay? So you understand the words, the sentences, you understand the text. So essentially, as a teacher, if I said, please write me a summary, you would be able to do that. Okay? So that's type one. Type one is obviously very, very important in academics. We ask students to write summaries all the time. More common, however, is expecting a situation model. So this is learning plus, as I like to call it. So you need to have a text base. You need to understand the text. You need to understand the hierarchy. You need to be able to summarize it, but what I'm asking you to do as your teacher then is to incorporate the content of the text with your knowledge. Your knowledge can come from personal experiences. It can come from other texts you've read, things you've heard, witnessed, experienced, your personal own research, et cetera. But I want you to integrate the content. So the recall is re reconstructive. So you can tell me what the author said, but then you can assess it you can liken it to something else. So instead of just the author said this, you're gonna say the author said this and disagrees with this other author for these reasons. That's a different level of understanding and comprehension and a different cognitive process than simply telling me what the author said. Very often, well, almost completely, um, when constructing a situation model, it's conceptually driven uh, research has shown that people who get to this level of comprehension with a text um, remember concepts. Their specific linguistic recall is actually quite low. So they, in fact, are automatically paraphrasing. They're not memorizing. They're not giving me the words the author used, right? Um, and this also allows them then to analyze, evaluate, et cetera. This is in academia considered learning. That's great. In order to do both of these types of comprehend, comprehension, pardon me, um, you have to infer. There are two main types of inferences, bridging and elaborative. An inference is defined as information from your memory, your knowledge, that is activated, applied to, and tested on a text but it's not stated in the text. So the text hasn't exactly said, this means this. I'll give you some examples. So bridging inferences are what you do as you're reading, almost always, um, to establish local coherence. So to understand the text. So for example, there are multiple types, but here are two. So anaphoric resolution. What does that mean? Well, a word, the text doesn't tell you what the word stands for, so you need to guess. An inference is essentially an educated guess. So if you speak English, you know the pronouns. 
So Angela and John went to the store and then the pronoun she. As you read the sentence, she bought bread, you are making an inference that she refers back to Angela, not John. But the text doesn't say she, Angela, so this is an inference. In order to understand the text, you have to make these inferences, and this requires linguistic knowledge. Guessing more so than unknown lexical items, using the text. So for example, the parents tried to calm down the verrückt children at the birthday party. So if you do not know this word, and you shouldn't because it's in German, I just did that assuming nobody here spoke German, um, you can guess the meaning. Can I actually have somebody guess what verrückt means? Rowdy, is that what you said? Yes. That is an excellent guess and very close to the actual meaning. Verrückt crazy? Means, it does, it in fact means crazy, a direct translation, yes. How do you know that? Well, you know that you have content knowledge, children, birthday party, usually not sleeping, and you have that also linguistic knowledge. So in order to understand this sentence, however, you have to have a guess at this word, right? So it's a content word as opposed to an article, right? And you don't need to have the exact definition to understand the meaning of the sentence. Right? So Thrishell's guess of rowdy, absolutely appropriate. It's close enough that you understand the content. So these are bridging inferences. You have to understand the sentences. All right, so let's go on to the harder ones. All right, so elaborative inferences. These are ideas that are strongly implied by a text, um, but you don't actually have to make them to understand the text, okay? So everyone knows schema theory, I hope, theory of background knowledge, right? What you have to do for elaborative inferences is directly apply a lot of background knowledge. Um, the only time you're gonna do it specifically just with the text as an elaborative inference is if you're going back very far in the text. So we know bridging inferences occur very locally um, and we're not attaching you know, an inference of she from paragraph one to an inference of he in paragraph six. We're not making that connection. Elaborative inferences we are. We're reading information in paragraph six and we're tying it to paragraph two. This is where you get into that analysis assessment, et cetera. So to specify, if you're reading a story um, and there's a young boy described as crying, he's holding an empty ice cream cone, you understand the sentence. If you decide that why he's crying, that's an elaborative inference. So there are multiple reasons he could be crying. Maybe he ate it all and wants more. Maybe it fell. Maybe he didn't like it, I don't know. Maybe he's crying for a completely different reason. So none of those answers help you understand the text, but you're going beyond the text. You're looking for things the text doesn't tell you based on your background knowledge. So elaborative inferences, much more cognitively difficult and involved than bridging, but absolutely required for academic reading especially academic reading to write. So again, schemata. Taking your background knowledge, there's two types of schemata, world and linguistic, essentially, content and formal. So content knowledge is what you know about the world, topics. Uh, formal schemata is what you know about the language and the structure thereof. So you need more than linguistic knowledge to read and to read at a high level and to read academically. You need to be able to look at the text and envision real world applications and situations, but you have to do that yourself. The text doesn't tell you. And a lot of teachers don't tell you, they just expect you to do it, right? That knowledge comes from you, right? So the more you read in a field of research, the easier it seems to read, well, that's because you have a lot of domain knowledge. So as you build up more and more background knowledge in a field, it's easier to read because you have much larger schemata for the topic, 
right? These absolutely can cause L2 readers difficulty if they don't know the field or they don't know the culture, uh, they don't know literary expectations. These can in fact cause issues if they don't know. Of course, it can cause L1 readers issues too, um, but obviously it's been researched far more in L2. So there's two types of schematic and your linguistic knowledge. So if I give you a text that is far, that's at an IELTS 8.5 and your IELTS 5, you're not going to be able to read it. You may be able to read pieces of it, but you're not going to be able to read it to make a full text base. It's above, right? It's too difficult. Um, if I give you a text that's an IELTS 6 and you're an IELTS 7, but it's on... Stephen Hawking's theory of the universe. While well, linguistically, it's okay. I don't know about you, but linguistically, I can read an IELTS 6, but something Stephen Hawking wrote, an academic paper, I'm probably not going to understand a lot of it because I don't have the background knowledge in the field. So there's two major areas at play, what you know about the world and the topic and what you know linguistically. This paper was um, quite well received academically. Most of the inferencing research we know about um, is done with narrative texts. So stories, novels, newspapers, etc. Why? Because every culture has them, everybody reads them. English literature is a big field. But then what we started to notice in 99, well, that was pre my time, but it still holds true, is that the type of text, in fact, affects inferencing. So if you're reading academic expository texts and you inference one way with narrative, it doesn't hold true with expository. Why? Well, there's multiple theories. Uh, narrative tend to elicit more interest. Um, we, Several studies have showed up to nine times more inferences with people reading narrative texts than expository. Narrative tends to be more interesting, right? Um, many people, every culture has narratives, has stories. So people tend to be much more practiced with reading narrative structures. Um, expository texts also vary quite differently um, than narrative looking across fields, genres, focuses, there's more variety. Uh, narratives in every culture tend to follow a similar pattern. Um, everybody has far more schema for narratives and life stories and other things than they do generally for academic texts. And narrative texts uh, actually have a lot more forms of causality, right? A lot of academic texts can seem just blunt, direct, here's the information, and they won't necessarily tell you a cause, you're supposed to figure that out yourself. Whereas narrative texts will tie back to causes, um, they have a lot of markers for that, in fact. So we cannot assume that somebody who is an excellent narrative text reader will be an academic text reader. So all of that information, what does that mean? Well, none of my students, generally, are going into English literature. Uh, they're going into different fields. So I know that they need to read academic expository texts, but what kinds and how. So I know all this stuff about reading. What do my students need? And clearly, I'm talking about the North American context. But uh, so I completed a needs analysis. Um, so what is a needs analysis? Well, this is collecting and assessing information that is relevant to my courses. Uh, what do my students need to do? And then I have to figure out how I'm going to teach it, right? Um, but because I teach English for academic purposes, I have to teach them linguistics, right? I need to bring their language up because my courses are pre-sessional. So my students generally have been accepted into their college or university programs. Uh, it's their English level they need to bring up. So instead of redoing an IELTS or a TOEFL, they can come see me 
and the universities and colleges accept this. So I need to know linguistically where they need to be, but I have to know what kinds of things, the tasks in the target situation. So where are they going? And what are they gonna be doing there? That's what I have to teach them. And I can't teach them how to do that if I don't know. And then once you do a target situation analysis, that's a TSA, then you can analyze what the target situation wants and translate it into course outcomes. Great, how? Well, again, I need to know where they are. So what do my students know right now? And what do they need to know to succeed? So I'm going to give you a brief overview of the findings of the needs analysis uh, that I completed for my students several years ago. It's referenced in the reference slides if you want to read it, uh, the whole article. When you are doing a needs analysis, you need to define several things first, because uh, it frames your research. You need to know the purpose of your needs analysis, why are you doing it, um, the context that you're looking at, the population that you're looking at it for, because that does matter, um, and in order to take the findings and translate them into course outcomes, what, what is your language theory about language learning and language teaching? So um, my institution gave me a purpose. They decided that we would do a major curricular revision. Um, we used to have five levels of English proficiency courses that were a full semester. Uh, they decided that we would go to 10 levels, each level being an eight week term. So within one semester, you had two levels instead of one. And in order to do this, it's not as simple as just cutting a curriculum in half. Um, I won't get into that, but you, you can't just cut it in half. Right? So we used to have level five, which is currently levels nine and 10. And in the old model, we had students write a purse, so writ writing, uh, students wrote a personal chronological essay, which has value, um, and they were very linguistic-based outcomes, right? Students will be able to use passive voice. Is this good? Is, are we actually serving our students well? So uh, we also went to more integrated. So instead of a reading course, a writing course, a listening and speaking course, a pronunciation course, a grammar course, we integrated them. So the listening and speaking pronunciation course, we put all those things together, uh, 12 hours a week became reading, writing and grammar. So in looking at what our students need, we also had to reframe how we teach it because I had to teach reading, writing and grammar all together. And then because of that, we actually increased the number of teachers and we were finding large inconsistencies in how course content was delivered. So our program is English for general academic purposes. Um, so students from tons of different backgrounds going into different programs. We have students who had just finished high school or secondary school going into college or university. We have students who have PhDs who are doing graduate work in Canada because they've just immigrated. Um, so we have a huge range. I've taught people with doing PhDs in linguistics and applied linguistics. And I've taught 17 year olds who are going into travel and tourism. And it's very common that people like that will be in the same class. Um, so some people know, have background knowledge or schema of their fields and some don't. Because of that, we cannot do English for specific purposes. I cannot focus my vocabulary curriculum, et cetera, on one field of study. That's not fair. Right. So it's not English for specific purposes or occupational specific. A lot of people aren't going in to work immediately, so we can't do that. Um, and the academic background of our students is not relevant to me. I need to get their English up. Uh, it's the programs that they've applied to that worry about their secondary or previous university grades, etc. All of our students are adults. The youngest we have is 17. Uh, the age range is generally 20 to 50. It's quite, quite broad. Um, 
multiple first languages in the classroom. Um, we have a mix of international and domestic students. And so as you can see, this causes some issues. Um, our language theory is very communicative. So the Canadian language benchmarks is essentially the Canadian version of the CEFR, the Common European Framework of Reference. They're written very similarly and they're based on the same communicative models, basically. They're also task-based, right? Students will be able to do something, a task, not necessarily a grammar point, right? So students will be able to explain past work experiences in a job interview, so as opposed to students will use present perfect to talk about job experiences. So we're looking at completion of a task as opposed to specific discrete structures. Great, uh, but we still have to assess our students how they're going to be assessed in their target situation or we can't say that they will be successful. So we need to do both, right? So we still have to assess, it has to be tax, task-based, pardon me, um, but we have to include linguistic as well as task. Uh, my task-based approach at level 10, which is my focus, that's the one I'm in charge of, um, it's gotta be authentic, as close as authentic as possible to the target situation. It has to be interesting. Nobody wants to read a bunch of academic articles on something they're not interested in. Uh, I have to focus on meaning. Uh, you can make grammatical errors and still have a very clear message. I need to define their tasks. What are you doing? What pieces of that do you need to know to be able to get there? And I have to be able to define the linguistic, semantic, pragmatic, rhetorical, and the content. They need to have input. They also need to give output. And Yes, I do teach specific grammar points. I do teach specific vocabulary points. So that's a focus task. I do absolutely focus on linguistics, but I will also do unfocused tasks where it's task completion more so than a specific linguistic structure. So if I ask you to do a job interview, which I don't, um, you could do that using simple past tense, present perfect. You have options linguistically. I'm looking at, did you finish the task? The study included 51 professors across college and university um, and across several fields. Uh, we looked at all of the skills. I'm just gonna talk about what we found for reading. So the professor said, and this is a Likert scale out of six. So at 4.5 or higher, uh, we decided that that was very important for academic success as defined by the professors. So what you can see from the reading competencies <laughs> is you need to read academic journal articles, um, assignments, that's important, vocabulary, fact, opinion, etc. But all of these things in reading, if you remember back to what we talked about, these are very text-based. The professor said, when reading articles, we want you to be able to understand them. Great. And skim and scan. But you need to be able to understand the content. So all of the reading, text-based. Where we found a problem is when we found out what they wanted them to do with writing. So again, 4.5 out of 6 was considered extremely important for academic success. So as you can see, writing summaries, while important, not at the top. Okay, so they want a text base, but what do they want? They want, your, they want my students to be able to synthesize material from different sources that express competing viewpoints or areas of emphasis. That's very important. So remembering back to what we talked about, I need them to be reading at a situation level while analyzing for competing viewpoints, being able to define them, and then being able to discuss how they're different. That's a different kind of reading, but it's considered a writing skill. All right, short answers on tests and exams. That could be either. They definitely at least needed text base for that. Essay exam under a time constraint. Okay, so what kind of essays are they making them write? 
And we listed very, very common rhetorical structures and the only one the professors deemed essential for academic success was a critical analysis. Oh, that was surprising. A critical analysis essay based on, as you can see, research, this is multiple readings, synthesized critically. This is a whole different kind of reading. Uh-oh, paraphrasing, okay, that goes back to situational. My writing to the professor is important. Proofread, revise, and edit, okay. They have to be able to read their stuff critically and listen to feedback given. How do I do this? So I have to teach students how to read for a text base, except I need to teach them how to read for a situation base while they're writing. Okay. So we opted for direct strategy training, being very, very explicit, telling them exactly what is expected and how to do it. And why did we choose direct? You can teach things indirectly and it can work. When it comes to language strategies, however, direct explicit seems to work best. Um, the five elements are, okay, so what is the strategy? What are you doing? Why are you doing it? How to do it? When and where to do it? And when and where not to do it, by the way. Um, and how to evaluate whether or not it worked. Oh, and by the way, this is direct strategy training. This is specific to adults. Uh, teaching kids is, is different. Adults want to know this stuff, right? I don't know about any of you, but I mean, I've taught something and it inevitable. If I miss why they need to do this, somebody's going to ask me, why do I need to know this? Where am I gonna use it? So adults really want to know this and this increases uptake. So, what we found, so after we had our needs analysis, more research, a lot of L2 learners um, ask the incorrect questions to complete academic reading and writing tasks. Okay. So in, I've been researching this for a while. In 2012, I developed a way to teach it. So knowing that you need to go from text-based to situation-based, the first thing you need to have is a text base. So when I'm teaching reading to write, we start off with reading and we start off with text-based reading, right? What is the main idea? What's a thesis statement? How is this hierarchy, blah, blah, blah. And then I test this by making students make me maps, mind maps or outlines. Um, I give them choice. They can make them pretty, they cannot be pretty. It's, they can be computer hand-drawn, I don't actually care, but I want them to show me that they've understood the text, okay? So the step one is make me a graphic organizer. Um, some research has shown that you should make your graphic organizers match the rhetorical structure of the text. Um, FYI, it, which works for a lot of people, not everybody, so I don't force it. Um, so I make students make me an outline or graphic organizer of the text. Uh, we take it up as a class to make sure that they do, in fact, have an accurate text base. They understand what the author is saying. They understand the structure of the text, etc. Once everybody has that, then we can move on. So in my course, Students, in fact, have to do an annotated bibliography because, as you saw from the research, they need to be able to understand the texts. Right? So this is what they do. They have to read three academic articles or book chapters, etc. Um, I do the same thing. I make them, after we practiced it, they have to highlight, underline, or identify the main ideas because the summary should only include the main ideas. Um, they have to do this for three sources that are academic uh, that will in fact relate to their essay that they're going to write for me. So I'm building throughout the term. Um, each summary needs to be about 400 words, give or take. Um, and then there has to be one or two sentences at the end that tell me if it's good for their essay and how. 
This can change, they know this, they can continue to read and modify their topics slightly, but I want them, I'm trying to get them to that situation base. So we've got the text base, I can check to make sure they've understood. And then why is this going to help your essay? So I'm making them start to think past the text. This task hits all of those outcomes that the professors identified for reading. To get them to the situation based, for a critical analysis, this is difficult for native speakers because this is just a difficult academic skill. So how do I get my L2 students there? Well, that direct strategy training, I actually talk about inferences and I talk about questions. So in order to read a text for situational comprehension, you need to ask questions. The questions, however, have to relate directly to the text. You can't ask about general things that the text just mentions. They have to be very, very tied to the text. And then when you answer those questions, you have to cite the information in the article or the text. And then you have to apply either personal knowledge or personal experience. So we start with what's called a personal response. So I'm not asking them to talk about different articles. I give them articles that are related to something in their lives. So I tend to give articles around uh, learning a second language, different cultures, immigrating, international students, et cetera. Something they all have a lot of personal knowledge about. And then I actually show them how to read for writing a personal response. So I'll read a paragraph and I will say, okay, so Angela wants me to agree or disagree with the author on several points, but I have to say why I disagree and I have to give examples, right? You have to support it. So for a personal response, I don't want research, just what you know or think. So we, I read a paragraph, okay, do I agree with the author, yes or no? Okay, yes. Okay, so why do I agree with the author? What about my personal experience or my mom's or my friends or my colleagues is the same or similar? Why do I disagree? And we actually talk our way through it as a class. Um, and then we collaboratively write an answer, right? So text A explained many recent immigrants experience, blah, blah, blah. In my opinion, this is incorrect for some because blah, blah, blah. And we do this repeatedly. And we talk about the link between reading and questioning and writing. So we start with a personal experience because it's very easy to make those inferences comparatively because they're yours, right? So explicit, model, practice, great. Once they can do a personal response, then we can get into a critical academic response. The structure is similar, but where you're getting that personal knowledge is a different place. So their final essay, which takes a process, uh, they write a summary critical response essay, about 1250 words. It's critical analysis but it incorporates, again, those things that the prof said they need. Critical analysis, they need research, and it adheres to the most common length. They have to include mul multiple academic sources, a minimum of three, and then they're allowed to supplement with course readings. And they can do more than three if they want. What does this do? Well, this requires them to synthesize across multiple sources. And it requires them to integrate information. And I teach them how to do that. And I'm going to get to that in a second. They must draft. They must plan. So acceptable standard. I can check this. We can talk about it. How do they incorporate feedback? Well, I look at their plan and I tell them they need to do X, Y, Z. They need to fix it and come back to me. They do at least two drafts that they're graded on. They give me an essay draft, I give them a whole bunch of feedback, 
They take it, they revise it based on my feedback, they resubmit it, and I mark that second draft as a whole new essay. So I'm rewarding them for revising and incorporating feedback. I require them to do some extensive and intensive reading. Uh, the course topic, the eight weeks, everything we study is applied linguistics. Um, and then they are allowed to choose something within applied linguistics for their essay. So I've had students who were going into the aviation program who researched um, the development of standardized aviation English across the world. I've had recent immigrants who wanted to look at child second language acquisition because their kids were in Canada in school learning English. How, how do I keep my heritage language? What's going on with my kids? So thankfully language fits into pretty much every topic. So that's how I get the uh, interest, et cetera. What do they need to do while they're looking for those articles? Well, there's a volume, right? Um, but they need to skim, they need to scan and they need to evaluate sources, right? I do not accept newspaper articles. They must be academic and they have to analyze them. Are you talking about facts? Are they opinions? I need to know the main ideas. You have to be able to tell me support and 80% comprehension is they've understood the article. So great, how do we get them to this final product? After we've done all the other stuff I talked about, we've summarized, then we get to the personal response. Then we start to do it with smaller readings in class. So here's an article called English Let Them Die. This It's a short piece, about 800 words, that talks about just, you know what, English is gonna take over the world. Let's just let minority languages die, who cares? It's less flippant than that, but basically that's the main idea. This one is about, Canada and that the bilingualism rate is dropping and this article argues for we need to get more people bilingual and multilingual we shouldn't be letting these minority languages in Canada die. So I've got two opposing points of view on the same topic. We go through them, we read them, we make sure they have a text base and then we start to talk about how do they speak to each other? How is the information similar? They can agree or disagree, but you're looking for relationships with content, and this is how you integrate and synthesize across texts. So here's a quote, here's a quote. Here's how those quotes are related. They're talking about the same thing, whether or not they agree or disagree. And this also. So and we do that for multiple articles, and then we start to put them into writing with citations saying you need to synthesize across texts within paragraphs. And ladies and gentlemen, I have um, some references and suggested readings for you that I used for this presentation. And I am ready for any questions. All right, great. So we're picking up great momentum. So I'm not going to spoil it. Dr. Hashini, over to you. You can take it away. Hello, everyone. Good evening, everyone, everyone in Sri Lanka and Prof. Angela, good morning to you. Thank you very much. It was a very wonderful session. I learned so much. And it really refreshed my memory as well on reading skills. Wonderful work. Thank you and keep it up. Nice seeing you today as well. And Trisha, nice to see you here. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Hashini Abesena, and I currently live in Australia, and I'm from originally from Sri Lanka. And I'm from the University of Kalania and all the credit of all my work should go there because that is where I did my bachelor's and master's. And I was a lecturer back in Sri Lanka and I work as a lecturer here too. And I was a research assistant and I did my PhD in Deakin University, Melbourne. So this is what I did for my research for my PhD. And uh, actually I'm, I'm going to disseminate some of my findings that I already published in one of the international conference proceedings with my executive supervisor, Prof. Indirian again. Okay, um, before starting the session officially, I just want to know whether anybody is interested or whether anybody has already heard the term linguistic shame and shaming. Anybody? I hope everyone represents ELT here and even if I use certain jargons. So everyone knows what shame is and everyone knows what shaming is. 
So basically what linguistic shame and shaming is, the shame related to language, the use of language, very simply. Okay, and uh, for example, we have shame, we all have experienced shame or shaming in our lives at least once, once in lifetime, probably in terms of marriage, in terms of relationships, in terms of um, anything else, friendship or employment, whatever the thing it is, sometimes we get the blame from the family, uh, saying that you brought shame into the family or you bring shame to your school, you brought shame into your university, something like that. And from that experience, we all know shame is something negative. Throughout, it is something negative. But that is where my uh, research interest, you know, uh, started unfolding because I really wanted to know what this linguistic shame and shaming is and why most of the, most of the non-native speakers of English are hesitant to use English as a second or a foreign language because they, we all have this inner fear or we sometimes have this self shame, the shame within ourselves, thinking that people would laugh at us, people would uh, sort of humiliate us or people would even uh, talk about the way that we use English and that would bring shame to ourselves as well as to the things and the people we represent. So that is the background story of linguistic shame and shaming. And this I have connected to teacher education in Sri Lanka because I know that you all are representing ELT in the country. And uh, the research findings show interestingly that uh, the, the perceptions, the, the perceptions that uh, we had from the ELT experts in the country in Sri Lanka show that these aspects of linguistic shame and shaming is not something which is visibly available amidst ELT, ESL learners, but that is something within the teachers or teacher trainers as well. So that is something um, sad in a way. And also the fact that people start going for spoken English classes soon after their A-levels, soon after their O-levels, even though they go to school for 13 years and teach or learn English for 13 years, they still try or struggle to speak in English. They still have certain issues related to the use of English, mainly because of linguistic shame and shaming. Amidst all the other political, cultural, uh, whatever, you know, uh, religious, caste and caste issue, class and caste issues, or any other attitudinal issues, among all the other issues, linguistic shame and shaming is one of the main issues or challenges that we have as a country representing the non-native settings of speakers of English so that we are unable to give our fullest communication in English because of this issue. So that's why I thought of sharing this with you all, especially this represents teacher education. Probably you belong to either pre-education pre or in-education. You, you could be uh, pre-service educators or you could be in-service educators. So it is always good to know what the classroom issues are. These things we do not talk in public because even the researchers have said that we have an inbuilt shame or we have a shame by default to talk about such shameful matters. So even to talk about things where we got humiliated or we felt shame related to language brings shame to us again. So based on such we do not want to talk about these issues publicly or openly. So it, I think it is a very good platform that we talk about this issue. And if you are happy to share your experiences, share your teaching experiences or learning experiences as in how you experienced this linguistic shame and shaming, I think it would be a really good idea so that we can, as a team, collectively, collectively can think of the potential or the viable ways in which we can counter this practices in the classroom. Okay. If you have any problem, just uh, let me know, just put it into chat or feel free to uh, talk at any time. No problem. Just disturb me and we can talk. Okay. So this is the overview. So we are basically talking about the perceptions and practices of linguistic shame and shaming, which is associated with English language use and how it affects the, the willingness of communication in English. So you, I think you would be probably, um, uh, I 
uh, anybody who is familiar with this term, willingness to communicate, we also say WTC. I'm trying my best to put it into very simple terms that everyone can understand what I'm talking about. If anybody knows what willingness to communicate is, just uh, raise your voice and just um, we can have a go. And in linguistic terms, we call it WTC. And always linguistic shame and shaming has a rapport between uh, willingness to communicate and certain other things that I'm going to talk later, right? So the, the aspects of linguistic shame and shaming, this particular situation has been in practice. You would be surprised if I say so. It is in practice since colonization. So that is where it all started. And I'm, we, we should be ashamed as sometimes as a nation because we still have this issue going on very heavily. It could be in universities, it could be in family life, it could be in uh, the secondary schools, it could be your employment, it could be at your workplace, it could be at your higher studies, wherever, right? So it is an issue that has been in practice since colonial or post-colonial contexts like in Sri Lanka. And it is not an issue which is only available in Sri Lanka, but it is everywhere. But if I compare the native speakers and the non-native speakers, the, the aspects of linguistic shame and shaming are more prevalent in non-native settings than in native settings. We know, right, even in Sri Lanka, we have a saying, we always know in our, within ourselves that people, from the same background would laugh at us if we make a mistake in English. We always think, or we always tell, okay, the, 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 the original speakers of English, they wouldn't laugh at you, if you even if you make a mistake, even if you make a pronunciation error, they wouldn't mistake, they, they wouldn't laugh at us. They won't humiliate you. But if I make a mistake in front of my own people, own crowd, or even in, in front of some non, other non-native speakers, Maybe the ones who speak Indian English, maybe the ones who speak, uh, speak Chinese English, maybe the ones who speak um, whatever the other English variety. So probably they would laugh at you, but not the original speakers. Okay, so that is uh, an assumption we all have in our day-to-day -day life when we use the language. So uh, after going through all these presentation slides, I think probably you would understand why we say so and what is the, you know, the cognitive, emotional and attitudinal issues for this kind of, a, this kind of uh, an ongoing or nonstop issue that we come across as a nation. Okay, so these practices of linguistic shame and shaming create in, in instructional challenges. So as a synonymous term, I would use pedagogical challenges pedagogical struggles, instructional challenges, not only for the learners, but also for the teachers. That is one thing. So practices of linguistic shame and shaming are everywhere in the country, as I said. It could be in urban suburbs, it could be in non-urban suburbs. But we know that the facilities, the resources, lack of teachers, exposure. So these issues are, you know, more in practice in disadvantaged areas than in urban areas. Even if you take Colombo, even if you take Kandy, the major cities in the country, even if you take Mathura, Jaffna, wherever, we can't say all schools are good. We can't say they all have the same level of facilities. They all have the same level of resources. There are, even in Colombo, there are schools where they, they do not have adequate number of English teachers. They do not speak English even as a second language, even during the period of English, they have no exposure to English. Sometimes the class teacher comes and speak in, speaks in Sinhala or Tamil, or they use mother language so much more than required to teach English, even in some tuition classes. So what are the root causes for this? And even, um, I think you all can remember the story where there was a big uh, stir in the country where the, the English teacher, one of the English teachers, couldn't speak properly on a public platform uh, with the president and people were saying so many things against the teacher. But as ESL practitioners or as ELT practitioners, practitioners, we have to think about these things in a different perspective, in a different angle. So why did that teacher uh, have to face that kind of an, you know, in, instance, for example, 
why like probably she didn't have enough exposure when she was still learning english as a second language she didn't have good facilities she didn't have good english teachers and there's something wrong with the country's policies the policy making the policy planning there's something wrong with that and that is why she still struggling to use english while appreciating the fact that she had the guts to stand up and talk on behalf of everyone there we also should think about what has kept her doing so what has bothered her of not uh, improving herself maybe as an english teacher so probably these issues like in linguistic shame and shaming and all the other personal or other so, sort of uh, socio political issues in the country must have paved the way for her to be in that situation so always there are two things of an issue and especially as esl elt practitioners we have to be aware of these things and how to mitigate these things without only criticizing because i know i used to work for the national institute of education for for some for several years before i um, came here so we were the body to make curriculum for all the languages all the subjects but we know the hardships we all undergo right i mean people can tell a lot of things people can criticize a lot but when it actually comes to practice when we actually have to sort of um, you know address these issues then we realize the basis the 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 root causes of these practices and actually those things have been in practice since colonization or even in during even from the post colonial settings so the problem is um, more complicated than we really think is that is one thing so coming back to our discussion on linguistic shame and shaming i would say these things are in place in the classrooms or anywhere most probably in a very tacit way in a very implied way so that we as teachers or even the students or even the parents or all the other stakeholders in the industry uh find it quite hard to see what the real issue actually is so we call it the tacit nature the tacit nature is the, impl the the implicit nature in which these practices are they are within the instructional uh settings that is one thing so it adds uh, another additional layer of difficulty for the teachers to tackle this issue for the policy makers to amend these issues to come up with new policies so the whole thing is connected in a very you know in a very um, hard and uh, uh, very hard and you know like um, let's say in a very hard way that things are not uh, going to work properly if we do not address these issues at least in our own capacities in near future so that as yes elt practitioners you all have to remember that is one thing so awareness of this linguistic sh linguistic shame and shaming is one thing so the real nature of these practices and the extent to which they manifest in pedagogical settings is fundamental for the teachers to address this issue so sometimes now even when i went for data collection for this research the teacher some teachers were aware of what this is in their own capacities but the definitions or the interpretations they gave was very superficial so they were not aware of this matter in depth that is one thing so sometimes even if the student is suffering from uh, the you know from different symptoms associated with linguistic shame and shaming for example the physical issues if somebody is having shame related to language it could be uh, you know visible from the facial expressions that person can you know blush or they stammer when they talk when they talk in english when they have to uh, speak up when they have to stand up and speak in english at least a few words so these are signs of linguistic shame and shaming sometimes but if the teacher is unable to understand what it is and they don't know the concept behind that so probably they would go for misinterpretations they would say okay the the, the student is uh, very you know um they are not uh, quite into the language and they do not want to uh, they do not have any motivation to read the read the text or they they are very naughty so then you know it, it's with their age uh he is weak he is a slow learner different you know different uh, misinterpretations could be given but the reality lies somewhere else and if the teacher is unaware of these matters so the student or the student will have to continue with these sufferings till the end so even if he is at work even if he still 
uh, has this um, phenomena of linguistic shame and shaming. Probably even at work, he can't speak. So he, he knows some English, but still he can't put it out because he's afraid to do so because he has a self shame and uh, he's afraid to be shamed by the society. That is that. So for this research, I collected data in Sri Lanka and that was in uh, Ampara. And I took uh, several schools which are disadvantaged, which are located in a disadvantaged area. And uh, I used uh, phenomenography as my uh, approach. And um, actually this presentation is only based on one section of uh, the data that I found for my PhD research. And uh, I will discuss the implications of these findings as well, so that uh, it would be helpful for you all as uh, pre-service or in-service teachers to identify these issues and uh, to try different uh, mitigation strategies to counter these um, issues in real life scenarios. Okay. Um, so basically, a general awareness is essential as ELT practitioners as of what linguistic shame and shaming is or what these shaming practices are. It is quite useful because then only you can understand how these things are manifested in your classrooms, visibly or non-visibly. That is that. For example, in a very practical situation that we all must have faced so far, you could have seen if you go to a new school or even if you go to the university, sometimes there are cliques, you know, there are different gangs of students, friends. So one gang looks very posh and very sophisticated. They use a different variety of English. So the other gang probably or the rest of the class, they do, they, they, they do not uh, look very sophisticated of the, the so-called word posh that we always use in terms of using English. Okay. From maybe they use Sri Lankan English. Maybe the rest of the, the other the specific gang, the clique I told you uses standard Sri Lankan English, but they think they use British English, but they think they use American English. They do not know that they too use a mixture, maybe standard Sri Lankan English, maybe Sri Lankan English, but there's something different. Their variety of English is something different. So based on that, probably they always um, humiliate the rest of the class if somebody else makes a mistake, if somebody else makes a pronunciation error. So they try to humiliate. For another instance, have you, you all have heard this term actually. If somebody starts talking in English, people say, is it something that we eat? So that is how they put it. And if somebody is trying to speak in English, they say that is he is trying to be a kadda. Okay, you know what kadua means, right? So kadua is a weapon, the sword that is used to refer to English because it can cut people down. It can give people some opportunities for their upward social mobility, whereas it can also cut people down if they do not have enough practice in using the language. Okay, the phenomena, the, the, the concept of kadua is very important, the sword is very important and very um, common uh, the, in the Sri Lankan setting, referring to English. Clear? Uh, nice to see you, Fatima and Hironya on CAM. So do you have any experiences uh, related to linguistic shame and shaming so far or to your friends or if you are teachers in your actual class backgrounds? Since mm. this is a webinar, so yes, we can get some interaction. Is it, yes, is it morning for you, Dr. Hashini? Sorry, no, no, no. It's is it morning now. for you? It's, no, it's uh, it's around nine o'clock. Night. <laughs> so then it's good evening, oh, uh, Doctor Ashni. This is a very good point you have brought out, especially to do with I think this. Uh, I think I'm really encouraging. I'm also going to speak to some of the school and have this workshop done again uh, in the school okay. also. Uh, one of the main things that we are uh, seeing, even in the international schools, nowadays the one uh, thing is the linguistic uh, shaming is has been come as a major part and uh, that is nothing to do with uh, um, uh, to do with the education level it is the use of the language the opportunity is not first of all not given much there is a as we spoke about that english teacher she was struggling to answer the president uh, the you know to quit so i felt so sorry knowing her as a as a language teacher i know that it is quite difficult when you don't use the language you forget 
you know when you don't have a use of if the what what the what he should have done is uh, instead of that okay we understood your point uh, we just have to have a, a three years she has not used a language and she has been not using uh, probably she didn't get a job but they should have organized some forum on keep on uh, children or the teachers to keep on progressing in that now mm. it, this is uh, to do with government so but look at the english medium international schools primary teachers and the secondary teachers some of them still struggling because they come from uh, our uh, local university they are well educated but the language use is very less now they lose their confidence and they are having so if i you know as i uh, look at your points you are very clear and you are pointing out these are the reason if we can overcome this definitely it will help and uh, this is a major issue not to do with only the government sector to do with the international schools also so i have seen so many teachers has been uh, used um, certain words not using the proper language or not the correct um, pattern of terms to be called so that has been uh, among the children has been uh, you know uh, they have been doing this like mm -hmm. we had a teacher who used to say um, listen to me one of the leading school huh? so my sister and others they always uh, uh, criticize her okay miss okay miss we are listening listening okay so this is the, <laughs> the students so imagine how do we face this stuff so this is happening yes this is happening so just mm -hmm. uh, i would uh, want to know little more uh, you know from your side how to overcome this since you have yes. done your phd did this and thank yeah. you thank you fatima nice uh, talking to you yes that is a very interesting point and you know in sri lanka there are three tiers in um, international school settings right so there is this uh, first first um let's say like um, the, the the international schools which are in the first level second level and the third level so now the international schools are mushrooming in the country so the newly rich generations the newly rich families they always tend to send their children to international schools and most of the locally trained teachers after they retire from their government service as teachers or sometimes soon after completing their higher studies at unis they enter as teachers to these international schools so the parents of these international international school students do not speak english most of the time unless they come from that background so that is one thing okay the teachers so as you pointed out correctly most of the teachers are government school trained teachers or so ncoe national colleges of education trained teachers they have the local accent they have uh, learnt english uh, through the local curriculum but these international school students they are their medium of instruction is english and they have more access and more access to english than to these teachers when they were learning english or when they were taught english so there was a clash okay that is one thing and uh, that is the other thing is the attitude matter attitude issue is the other thing because most of the students in these schools i'm not going to tell uh, everyone because even i used to work for for a very famous international school in the country uh, but i do not think that i have met such arrogant learners of english in there i'm just trying to figure out if i have met any i don't think so because it is the uh, the upbringing right that is the attitude so the children from their angle they do not understand the discrepancy between these matters and that's why they always try to humiliate the teacher so this kind of a situation is always also available in most of the national colleges of education where uh, the pre service teachers are trained in the country and even some of the data were taken from uh, the ncoes so they are the participants were telling that even in their lectures there are students who have come from international schools most of the attitude is different so they try to figure out mistakes in the lecturer especially especially pronunciation or any other mistakes and then they are in their own clique as in the schools i told you they try to you know humiliate embarrass the teacher so there are different stories scattered all over in the country in the industry because of uh, these shaming matters they try to shame the teacher so one of the elimination strategies that another lecturer told me as i can remember is to ask them back a question related 
to language not related to the use of language maybe that lecturer or that teacher is not quite competent in using the language but she or he has the subject knowledge better than these learners so the trainers have been the trainers have been um, uh, uh, what uh, the trainers have been trained in um, the local universities or local settings but these international school people have come from the international school settings so now they are come, coming to the national colleges of education to become teachers to learn to become a teacher but they have this attitude they know better english than these locally trained teachers who lecture them in the ncoes so there is a clash sometimes so it comes with the attitude so if you if we come across such such situations probably we should always shame the shamer that is one one elimination strategies one of the elimination strategies but you have to shame the shamer to let them know that they also don't know something right they could be probably they could be better in their language use because they attended an international school where the medium of english medium of instruction was english but there are things that that those people do not know when it comes to teaching of english but the trainer or the lecturer knows better than the lecturer than the learner so in such sense as you told mitigation strategy a countering strategy would be shaming the shamer in a proper professional way without be you know like we cannot put ourselves into that grade they are students so even if we shame them we have to do it prof professionally i do not encourage you to shame your students but especially in such um, circumstances we could try doing that and then let them understand what this really is and even though they are good in language probably there are things that they do not know yet something like that clear okay and um, also now this is such a big issue but it is such a big issue but there is lack of research on elt practitioners awareness and understanding of this issue so that is one thing so as a country or in the industry even from the ministry of education national education national institute of education international schools and uh, any other particular body has not done much research on such practices which interrupt the users the non native speakers of use of english in the country so probably because of lack of research on this matter this still continues from the post colonial era so talking about the method if you are quite familiar with research methods uh, you can understand this better but if not i will simplify it uh, this study was um, a qualitative one you know there are two types of research studies quantitative and qualitative so this is on qualitative this belongs to the qualitative study and i used purposive sampling so for a, i use this sampling for a specific purpose right and i i took data from 16 participants some eight were english teachers the other eight were english uh, language trainers working for national colleges of education but for this particular research uh, article i got the participants opinions perceptions only from participant 1 to participant 8 but overall in my phd there were Uh, data from 16 participants okay eight of them were teachers i said eight of them were national uh, uh, lecturers at the national colleges of education i'm just trying to explain because if you are interested in doing any research so then you can take these things into consideration as in how you can uh, go ahead with your methodology right and the teachers were practicing in state funded schools so they were training in they were in service teachers in rural schools in four rural schools of located in ampara and it is one of the one of the economically disadvantaged districts in the country according to the central bank reports in 2016 and data were collected using semi structured interviews so it is a type of interview that we use to collect data okay semi structured interviews and uh, as i told you earlier these findings are based on only one section of my data collection shame and shaming and use of english in sri lanka 
So if I ask the audience, what is the variety of English you use? How can you answer me that question? Anybody who is interested to give the answer? What is the type of English or what is the English you use? Is it British English? Is it American English? Is it uh, probably Prof. Uh, Angela would be using Canadian English or anybody who has a perception on that? Fatima? Sri Lankan English. Uh, since, uh, since we are teaching in international schools, most of the international schools follow the Cambridge syllabus. So we are actually using the British English, but not accurately. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Who is that? I can't figure out who's speaking. That is Fatima only. Somebody okay, else Fatima. also been way between somebody uh, said something. Ah. I didn't. Yes, sir. Hirunya, what do you think? What is the type of English you use as you think? I have no idea about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you so Sri Lankan English in Sri Lanka. No? I think the same can, thing. We uh, can, uh, can shorten that to Singlish. Everyone yeah, same thing my daughter. Not shortened. particularly. Not particularly because... It's not Singlish actually, Singlish plus Tanglish. Sri Lankan English has Tamil also. Ah, okay, that's uh, interesting. interesting. Well, same thing, my daughters asked question me like two days ago, they are 14, they're twins. They were like, Ami, can you tell me what is the language actually English, type of English we use here? And I was kind of stuck. I, was, I had to tell like, <laughs> maybe in between uh, American and British English, something in between, <laughs> okay. we use both. So that's, uh -huh. what I that's a good so, answer. That's a yeah. That's a good answer. I would say, Trisha, what did you say? That was something interesting too. No, uh, everybody was saying Singhala, Singhala English, I think. So I just merged it and called it ah, Singhala. English. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. So we, you know, colloquially we say that we speak Singlish. I think it is just one variety of English. So probably I could say in Sri Lanka we speak Englishers. There are different varieties, standards of Englishers in the world, in the, we, in the country. So if you take the world first, we have Canadian English, we have uh, French English, which is merged as Franklish. We have German English, which is merged as Denglish, because in German, Ger uh, German is Deutsch. So Deutsch and English, it's Denglish. And Sri, Singhala, Sri Lankan English, Singlish. And um, what else? Uh, uh, what, what do you think is the variety of English used in India? Any any idea? Any any guess? Hirunya, you're on mute. There's actually an English, uh, Indian English variety. Yes, it is English. It is Indian English, and we call it English. And Chinese English, we call it Chinglish. So there are so many different varieties, which, which is very, very interesting to study. And uh, it is a very good idea to have an eye on these varieties because it, it is two-sided, right? <clears throat> because uh, it, is it is a very good idea for the original, the, you know, the native English speakers to have an idea, to have some sort of a familiarization on other varieties of Englishes. Because they have always, they have to work with others. In, now, now it is a, you know, we are in a global village. So in that sense, multinational companies, for study purposes, for employment purposes, it is always good to um, get some sort of an idea about the other varieties of English, which are non-native varieties. But still, as a whole, the number of non-native speakers are higher than the native speakers currently. So that is one thing. So we are becoming quite powerful in terms of, you know, this linguistic uh, um, ways and means because our own varieties are getting a sort of a recognition from others. So in the same way that we have given a recognition, we have given recognition to native varieties. So it's kind of equal, but we have to remember one thing. If we go for ILTS, if we go for any other international exam, even if we do sit uh, uh, local exam, I don't think we can write answers in our own variety. That is okay for communication, just for oral communication in our own groups, within the societies. We can use our own variety, but still, as we know, we cannot use the, that type of varieties, those, ty those types of varieties for official purposes, especially in writing, especially at exams or such. That is something, something to remember. Okay, so in Sri Lanka, along with the other standards Excuse and varieties me. of world Englishers, yes. Yeah, uh, 
is there any like uh, according to sri lankan english is there any writing varieties uh, or something like that because i have not uh, come across any changes uh, apart from using oh. british and american english so hmm. are there any uh, particular uh, sri lankan english uh, usages like i know for some uh, pronunciation and spelling uh, like sri lankan uh, words are used in uh, vocabulary wise are used in uh, uh, some cases but writing and grammar wise we don't have any sri lankan uh, english uh, particulars no uh may i know who speaking is is it uh, upamali or? yes i am upamali ah right upamali yeah. Th- thanks for your question it was interesting yes uh, what i meant was we can always use standard sri lankan english or sri lankan english or any other non native variety to speak among ourselves even internationally we can use it for communication orally but when it comes to standard writing exams or for very formal purposes uh, in in terms of writing i do not think we can use the uh, other varieties or standards which have been ori- which are originated locally that's the purpose okay so in sri lanka i was saying that there are basically two varieties of englishes standard sri lankan english and sri lankan english sri lankan english is the variety of english that is used for whatever the purpose that we are using it for, for there are different semantic morphological pronunciation uh do you know what these terms are so pro- phonological means uh, pronunciation related morphological vocabulary related right mm-hmm. and uh, syntax grammar related semantics sentence patterns meanings related so if you analyze these four components of a language if you take sri lankan english there are specific characteristics if you take standard sri lankan english there are specific characteristics we use a derogatory term to identify sri lankan english as not pot english the way we pronounce the sound o that is based on that so the even the way we pronounce the sound o the o sound differs in sri lankan english standard sri lankan english even in american english british english so there are differences for example in sri lankan english we use different question tags which are unique to the country can you give me one of them anybody no oh any no very good so we say it's raining no it's coming no uh, so if i tell it uh, to prof uh, angela i don't think uh, she would dance what we say okay if we say okay uh, let's finish this no it's getting uh, we are getting late shall we finish this oh it's raining no it's pothering no Uh, the prof, canadian uh, so say the canadian equivalent is the sound a ah uh, so i'll say it's it's pretty cold today a eh? so we we with okay. the same purpose just a different tag ah oh, see so yeah. those characteristics are everywhere so all all these varieties have the same thing so we use no or sometimes even we use ne and indians they use hena so different varieties it's raining no so we we accept we 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 try to get the other person's confirmation it's raining no and no sometimes any h it's raining ne and there are different um, things that we directly trans we cannot di- directly translate there are very unique and very sort of um, very sri lankan uh, sayings that we cannot directly translate into english for example there are sayings like um, in singhala we say gihing enna so if we just bid goodbye to someone and we say okay gihing enna it means literally we will we will go and come it doesn't mean that we will go out and come back at the same moment it will say we will see you soon that's what it means but if we use it with a native speaker so there is this funny story also because there was this um, native speaker and one sri lankan went there and they said goodbye and the sri lankan guy said okay i'll go and come but this uh, native speaker was waiting and waiting until uh, the other guy turned up he never turned up because he didn't mean to come back as soon as he left so what he meant was we'll see you soon so it's a direct translation and another thing like yanne kohe da manle pol so it is where are you going there are coconuts in the bag 
that is a direct translation but i do not see any particular way of translating that into english till today so those terms cannot be anglicized i guess so it's very sri lankan so um, along with these other pronunciation things and uh, what else um, if you say for giggle the girls giggle we say um, uh, kishibichi the kishibichi is the sound made by birds the chirping sound of the birds so the girls giggle in that way so in that sense we say they are kishibichi fine okay so kishibichi gana ko gana is this fine f i i n g and uh, if it is a drizzle poda gana so if it is a drizzle in sri lankan english we say we say it's pothering pothering is it there's a drizzle because the word for drizzle in sinhala in sri lankan language is uh, pother so it rhymes with bother bothering so in the same structure it goes as pothering actually it is uh, i think it is uh, uh, it has been coined from the uh, from uh, i can't remember exactly i think it ca- came from the university of kalania some time ago so the term pothering so we cannot use these things in our writing but still interestingly and uh, productively you can use these things in your speaking so if you use uh, such a thing in your day to day life maybe the speakers who think that they are american english speakers or british english speakers they do not actually they are not but still uh, they think they speak american english they think they uh, 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 use british english and they think it's a shame to identify them as sri lankan english speakers even though there are no separate very clear parameters to differentiate between which variety we all actually speak so i could be probably speaking in sri lankan english and standard sri lankan english both so these varieties of englishers are a way of either minimizing or aggravating the issue of linguistic shame and shaming even in elt settings that was the point so if you speak sri lankan english in the real sri lankan way probably it is a cause for linguistic shame others would laugh at you see she is speaking sri lankan english what a shame so that would be the attitude of some while the others would admire okay so that is something unique and that is you have a pride in using the variety of your own country so it is you know it has different uh, sides it has different uh, attitudinal you know differences so that is something uh, so the international school children as i come came back to um, fatima's point so they have this clash so probably the sri lanka the teachers are more sri lankan english speakers than them so then there is a clash okay and uh, the 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 very last point that i have given here is quite interesting linguistic i will read it for you linguistic shame is a sense of shame related to language use that occurs through perceived failure to meet the standards and expectations of others so that is something so we always perceive that we are, we are not in the standard that is expected by others because of that we develop a self shame we have we become shame ridden we say okay and because of the shame triggers so shame triggers are the people in the society or your colleagues your teachers sometimes who are waiting to shame you thinking or making you feel that you do not speak the expected standard unfortunately and funnily nobody knows what this standard exactly is even in sri lanka there is no particular body right i mean for example if i'm uh, prof angela you would correct me if i'm wrong there so i think in in um, french like in terms of french language there is a body right to um, uh, have these parameters ready like they, they know they they set the standards they set the rules and they work on this language differences or changes everything but in sri lanka unfortunately we do not have something like that so without a proper body how are we going to think of standardizing the language and to and to pinpoint someone and say hey you do not uh, speak the standard variety so that you are a piece of shame to the society so i don't think that is a logical idea to say so because we do not have such a body to pinpoint what the standard exactly is and 
how else to expect the standard from others when we do not have a particular standard body to um, set these parameters. That is something. I will give you just one minute to go through this slide as well. And here I have talked about the concept of kadu, this word that we use in English, a weapon that I told that could cut people down and also that could give power to people to use language. For example, most of the disadvantaged suburbs in Sri Lanka, in the Sri Lankan context, we humiliate them or sometimes the speakers themselves consider themselves to have, you know, undergone a lot of cutting because of this word matter, right? And even if they try to speak in English, others would laugh at it without giving them any opportunity to speak English, saying that they are trying to show off using kadua, using this word. So kadua always acts as a synonymous term for English. And it, this, this coin, the, the term has been coined by some rural ESL learners, according to Thiru Kandaya. So if you read about Thiru Kandaya, I think uh, you will get familiar about the whole background story related to Kadua, which means English in uh, metaphorical sense, but in literal sense, it's this word, okay? And uh, in the Sri Lankan context, there are different ways in which shame is manifested. One thing, very important that is collectively. So in Sri Lanka, India, most of these Asian countries are team-based or they, they give priority to the self of, uh, to the thing, you know, the, the collectivity, the sense of collectivity. So they always tell, okay, if you have a bad marriage, you bring shame to the family. Either you bring pride or you bring shame. So in the same way, if my clique speaks bad English, so I bring shame to my school. So if I uh, learned in this school and I do not speak enough English, so I am a piece of shame. So because of me, that school becomes also a place for shame. So sense of collectivism is very important because shame always goes as a collection in a collective sense. That is something. You know, it's interestingly, in, in, in certain situations, in certain communities, uh, you might have heard about this Kiribati, uh, the people in the country of Kiribati, we say e Kiribati. In that background, in that community, if you speak in English, even though you are an ELT stakeholder and you have to improve English as a, as a teacher or as a lecturer, people would frown at them people would condemn that, per that person who tries to speak in English thinking it is a shame. So for them, it is such a shame to use English for communication without using their own mother language. So that is one side of the story. But in Sri Lanka, opposite. So if you know a little bit of English at least, and if you, if you can manage with that sort of an English, it brings you pride. It gives you social status. So no matter whether you are educated or not, no matter whether you are you belong to a high class or low class, if you know how to manage your English, it gives you social recognition. It gives you social status. If your children study on foreign soil, it gives you status because if that country, the country speaks English and that the, the, your son or daughter is in that country, so you have some sort of a pride. You get social recognition from the society based on the fact that you have some exposure to English or you speak English. But in societies like in Kiribati, it is a shame for them to use English without giving priority to their own language. So likewise, there are so many scenarios and uh, there are different mechanisms in the world in terms of linguistic shame and shaming operations. Um, that is that. And um, here, as the last point, I have said feeling of linguistic shame are shared among linguistically different cohorts of people at intrapersonal and interpersonal. So that is what I was trying to explain through the other examples I told you. Intrapersonally, it is self-shame, whereas interpersonally, amidst your family members, amidst your friend cliques, amidst your uh, work buddies, based on the language use, you have the experiences, you may have experiences of linguistic shame and shaming. Um, 
Okay, and going to this, the second part, the large number of unemployed unemployed graduates coming from rural areas can uh, I cannot see can can need the market themselves, no contribute fully, nor get connected to the market demands with their passive knowledge of English. So that's what I said. So after going to school for 13 good years in Sri Lanka, finally, at the end of completing the ordinary level exams or GC advanced level exams only, they start to learn spoken English. So that is why most of the students, even some undergraduates, they do good subjects, but they do not have a market value because they do not speak quite of English and they do not uh, learn subjects that are marketable. They always, for example, if you take a typical Sri Lankan university situation in a government university, so you know there are raggers and anti-raggers. So most of these anti-raggers are people who are quite good in English. They do subjects which have an exposure to English, where they can use a little bit of English at least on campus so that they would go for a better job once they pass out. But if you do a subject, I do not want to tell the subjects here because it's not ethical, I would say. So there are different subjects. They have a good value, but end of the day, you have no future. So you end up in unemployment or underemployment because that subject does not want English to teach it or to learn it. So because of this clash, always the raggers, most, most probably most of the times, most of the time the raggers are coming from very rural areas who did not, who did not have exposure to English, but they are now in a very sort of a vulnerable position without jobs or any such um, means to go up in the ladder for social mobility because they do not possess good English. Good in a sense, like at least some sort of competency in English that they can work with when they enter the world of work. Okay, so that is one thing. And because of that, they have a sense of shame. So they say they are engaged in ragging, ragging because they want to shed away this shameful feeling which is within them because they know i have okay i have come from the rural i have come from a rural area and i did not have any exposure to english i did not have good teachers so how can the other person who comes from an urban setting with better english with better resources with better facilities better english teachers have free education in the same way they do not want that to happen so therefore they, you know, they always create issues on campus, they engage in ragging and put the other people who try at least to communicate it English down by uh, humiliating them. It happens, for example, even I have a personal experience. Um, whenever during ragging, I went to the uni one local university. So where there are is ragging, every university mo it has uh, ragging some sort of a practice at least tacitly. So when I was there on the very first day, when we said that when the raggers come and, you know, surround us everywhere and they ask for the subjects we do. So I did languages. So when I did English and other, some other modern languages, so they always come surround us and ask, okay, what is the subject you do? So did you go to school in Colombo? So when we said yes, the ragging starts to happen. Then they say, okay, uh, okay. Uh, how come we do not know English and you all know English? How come you did languages and we did not have the opportunity to learn languages? So likewise, based on such um, socio-political issues, they try to rag the other person who comes from an urban background or some better English than them to shame them. So by shaming the other person, they have a sort of a sadistic pleasure so what I did not have, this person has. So that is a sense of envy. That is uh, for which uh, the base is linguistic shame and shaming. So they cannot digest the fact that uh, the other person tries to speak in English, but I cannot speak English. So the best way to shame that person is ragging. So there are different uh, strategies going on even uh, in universities 
where the basis is linguistic shame and shaming, but it comes out, it is manifested in different ways. Tamima asks, uh, what's your opinion about Japan? Even if it's an international event, they don't care about English. They use their mother language. Yeah, so that is a good question because you know, um, if you take, I don't know whether you guys uh, are aware of this, if you are aware, the Kachruvian, Raj Kachru, Raj Kachru, the linguist, so he has given three circles related to the different uh, uh, varieties of Englishers and the different cohorts of English language speakers as non-natives. The first circle, the second circle, and the third one. So, so the first circle is for the native speakers. So countries like Australia, then America, Britain. So those are the countries which speak English as the first language. So the second language speakers are like us, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. So we all use English as a second language. So Japan is a country, if I'm not incorrect, belonging to the third category. So they, they learn English as a third language. So that is why they do not give priority to English. So they have their own Japanese variety of English as well, but they do not have, have give priority to English as we give because it's a, yeah, it is in the third circle, okay? But one, one hand, we have to be proud of our country because it gives us free education from grade one till the university. So that we all have to appreciate and we learn English as the second language from grade three, right? From grade one to grade three, we learn English through the ABO program. So ABO is the activity-based oral English program that is called ABO. Right? And through play-based techniques, we learn English in the primary. And then we learn English till the 13th grade, we have general English. And uh, then we learn English even at the university. That is the good side of that. But it is such a shame that people do not take uh, general English seriously in the advanced level classes, which is really, really good, which is such a nice platform to upskill yourselves on business English. It is such a good book that people do not use effectively. So if our students use it effectively, I am sure that by the time that they pass out from the, the school and by the time they enter the university, they have at least the basic or the intermediate knowledge of business English that they do not face shameful experiences when they enter the world of work. That is one thing. Okay. And so in terms of the situation in Japan, I'm not sure whether they learn English as a third language, even from grade one to grade 13 or till the last grade. But us in Sri Lanka, we all learn it from grade one to grade 13. So it is, there's something wrong with the system. That is true. I'm answering Jay's question as well. So there's something wrong with policy making, policy planning and policy designing and material writing, textbook writing, curriculum. There are flops here and there, but still, it is, the problem lies in the minds of the speakers as well, the students as well. So we cannot always blame the government or we cannot always blame the, blame the policy makers, universities, no. It's in our hand as well. So if you are an English teacher, if you are an English student, it is up to you too to do some research on your own. Get access to, or get, get the exposure where you have to use the language. So likewise, you have to get all these opportunities to upskill yourself and improve yourself and shamelessly to, press the, to start speaking whatever the variety you speak. So it's two-sided, two, the two you know, different sides of the same coin. Right, so talking about the challenges. So I already mentioned a few challenges as in um, policy planning, policy making, social cultural issues, and this issue has been coming from colonization, this and that, okay? And for example, if you have already, already, if you have heard about the JVP insurrections in, you know, 89 issues and 70 issues, 70 uh, those issues and all that, it happens because of this, uh, this uh, like linguistic shame and shaming was one of the issues which was underneath the matter, right? Because most of the graduates from the Sri Lankan context, they come from very rural backgrounds. So they could be scholars. They had the educational eligibilities to enter for good jobs, but still they lacked the language they wanted to have. So the urban crowd, even though they do not possess very good educational qualifications sometimes in comparison to the rural ones, 
they had some english in them so thanks to that english they could go up in the ladder and attain social mobility than the than the, uh, the rural ones so this led to unemployment and unemployment and these issues aggravated the heat between uh, different parties in terms of politics or in terms of attitudes or in terms of um, the agenda so these things paved the way for different insurrections in the country so it is this much complicated okay because english is something which creates opportunities it is something indispensable right so if you do not have inadequate teacher training resources uh, the poor language results in your school at the exams so all these things come in a baggage in rural socio economically disadvantaged areas that is something okay so here you can just go go through some of the excerpts i have given which um, reflect the consequences of linguistic shame and shaming for example these are some explicit stuff right there are implicit stuff there are explicit stuff so explicit is something that you can visibly see right you can see them in the class so there are things you cannot see in the class so as the teacher if you are aware of these things you know what is going on and how to handle the situation for example so one of the the one of the participants in the research was saying he was referring he or she was referring to the experiences that she or he encountered as a learner of english during her school time i guess they only use a few words in english only during the english period this is a teacher speaking about the students i think those students show signs of discomfort when they use english i think that is called linguistic shame and shame because the the question was whether they whether the teachers whether the teacher educators are aware of these phenomena of linguistic shame and shaming so this is how that particular participant is trying to interpret what he or she understand by the, by the term linguistic shame and shaming so he she or he thinks it is the it is the signs of this discomfort to use english i think it is called linguistic shame and shaming so it shows that the person the teacher is also not sure what this uh, phenomenon is they sweat and they stammer they shiver when they stand up to speak in english their faces show how fearful it is for them to use english naturally they do not want to be humiliated humiliation is also there with shame the next one they are hesitant to use english they lack confidence show signs of nervousness they try to be isolated in the class when i give them the chance of speaking the whole thing is called linguistic shame and shaming as i have understood so this is something very interesting right so even now we know what these things are exactly what these inhibitions are called and how they are dealt with in practical esl classrooms most of these definitions or interpretations given by the participants even though they've been working as an english teacher or as an educator for more than 10 15 years are unable to provide an in-depth interpretation for linguistic shame and shaming so the question is if they don't if their perception varies this much how can they identify students or other colleagues who really have linguistic shame and shame within them and how exactly pedagogically they can mitigate these practices in the esl classrooms so that is the worry okay and there's another one there's another excerpt i will read it for you um many esl lecturers and other colleagues coming from better classes with better english tried to shame us so this is a teacher speaking uh reflecting her experiences of learning english or any other subject on campus as a teacher okay and so she is referring to her university lecturers being a teacher in that capacity coming from rural areas with less english use some had a linguistic pride mixed with the intention to shame us so the lecturer is all all the even the lecturer is involved in shaming the students tertiary students on campus based on the variety of english they use okay i can still remember there as i didn't put it here uh, i don't want to use one particular suburb in the country in down south where they say 
uh, one people coming from that particular suburb can be easily understood or can be easily identified by the way they speak english so by hearing one or two words spoken by one particular person coming from one particular suburb in the down south in the country others those who think they are posh enough and using you know very sophisticated english they think even uh, i can even say one after hearing one or two words from that person i know she is from that area so that type of a you know like um, uh, that type of an uh, i don't know what to say with the arrogant or what sort of a thing to say um, it is interesting too because how they can identify people people's background people's class people's caste and from where they come by listening or hearing one or two words of english okay so that is the attitude attitude issue related to the use of language they didn't take us for their group presentations groups for presentations lecturers gave them more time for expressing ideas and in presentations but for us no so the lecturer is highly involved in linguistic shame and shaming here and she has always favored the people who come from urban backgrounds because she that lecturer thinks they they have a better potential and they have because they speak a better variety of english so these people feel an utter shame within them and it has created a sense of envy towards the lecturer and the other better so called better classes better speakers of english based on their shameful experiences so this is kind of a shameful narrative given by a person who was uh, who experienced shame and shaming in a tertiary classroom okay and i will read another interesting excerpt um the majority of students are shy they think that they do not know how to pronounce words most of the time they do not know the appropriate words to use i think they lack the language exposure due to less family support and family background so i can remember even the teachers uh, who held who had these interviews with us said they can't even blame the children who come to the classroom next day, next day without doing homework because the students always come and complain teacher i cannot do the homework because one person has done the homework because their classmates those the, the classmates who did the homework are the ones who have some family support and the parents know some kind of english but most of these children's parents are farmers and you know they do other odd jobs and they do not know english so therefore there is nobody at home to support them to teach english or to support them in learning english therefore english learning of english for them is just learning another subject in the school so they do not see the value the real potential of becoming a competent user of english when they enter the world of work because there is no family support and they do not see it as something indispensable for example sometimes they become a father because they become a farmer sometimes the father is a farmer so the children also want to become farmers in the future so they do not want to learn english so they have that kind of an attitude but some people very rarely they have the motivation intrinsic motivation within them an extrinsic motivation from the parents even though the parents do not know english they encourage the the, the son or daughter to learn english improve english so they anyhow try to learn english they use english anyhow even though the others humiliate them even though others shame them they learn english and they try to attain social mobility okay so this is something important and the um, i will read this excerpt as well so failure to adequately understand the nature of english linguistic shame has significant implications so in terms of the implications i'm reading this excerpt given by a participant we also can't do anything because we can't punish them all the time so this is a teacher talking about the students so we try to ignore and i do not think it's something very very serious so she thinks linguistic shame and shaming that she experiences among the 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 students in the class uh, is not something quite important you know not something very serious we have seen it enough but we can't do anything we can't punish them all the time because it is not only their shame 
when they go to the extreme it comes out as anger or even a hidden jealousy okay so they have an envy they have an anger i told you even it was one of the reasons when we analyze it in terms of linguistic backgrounds so for even in, in the insurrection the what the rest of the different issues political issues in the country it is at a very less visible level you know so that means it's very tacit very implicit it's very hard to see even they do not know about it know us so i also don't know about linguistic shame and shaming as a teacher they also don't know the consequences of linguistic shame and shaming as students but sometimes we avoid such things as we say them not to laugh at others when making a mistake i try to take words from them anyhow but they are very dumb now see so maybe the students have linguistic shame and shaming they have the signs of that but the teacher is interpreting interpreting them as very dumb children very naughty children where they are very they become very jealous they they become very angry towards others and also they are dumb that's why they they can't speak in english that's why they keep on laughing at others they keep laughing at others because they also don't know english but still they do not want others also to uh, make an improvement to avoid that to cut it down they keep embarrassing others okay they belong to the same i am also a daughter of a farmer she is also a daughter of a farmer she is able to learn english she has no shame she starts speaking english she wants to improve but i do not want to improve english i do not know english but still i keep bugging the person i keep you know um, embarrassing the person so different attitudinal issues okay so only participant 5 so one of the participants offered strategies to confront learners beliefs negative beliefs of learning english so this is that i have i have to give them a positive attitude on the language so this teacher was very positive she has a hope for change usefulness of it build up their confidence and reduce shame and shaming practices gradually giving them the correct way of saying even the simplest things as they are big students so they are concerned about their image that i cannot tarnish it so she is thinking she cannot tarnish the image of these children because they are grown ups and they, i can't humiliate them publicly based on their esl literacy so my policy is being double patient so she practices patience and tolerant tolerate them in reducing their shaming cases but though they are like that in the first year to use english that failed mentally mentality shame and shaming issues and all they try a little hard in the second year so maybe it is the shame plus other things that i as i told you not only shame so this is another good thing so shame is not only the issue right shame is always amalgamated associated with other personal and contextual issues for example geographical issues for example other personal matters so along with that for example family shame so the family is um known to be a bad family so that kind of a family shame is brought forward to the esl classroom so the child does uh, think in a way uh, of having a self shame within them to use the language family shame is converted to to linguistic shame so it acts in different way it manifests in different ways okay so coming to the last segment mitigating strategies of linguistic shame and shaming so before coming to this session any any questions fatima any questions hiranya prof angela all good okay madam right. excuse me yeah madam can i yes. ask you a question yeah yeah sure Actually, go ahead uh, yes as sri lankans i have seen lots of uh, like students are trying to imitate an accent so do you think like you know what do you, what do you think about it like you know do we have to follow any accent or british or american or whatever australian or any accent do we need to have an accent when we talk english the interesting question i do not think so i do not think that we all should aspire to a different accent right i mean we all have our own accents so as sri lankans we actually speak in a quite you know 
a flat accent but if you take the yes. canadian ac accent it's different if you take the german accent it's different if you take british yes. different australian different so they all have their accent differences i do not personally believe and i do not think that prof angela also agrees that we should aspire to a different accent all right okay? madam accent is not something that we should judge another person's level of english or the competency it's a whole lot yeah. of other things which come as a bunch not only the accent it's a very is sort of a unique thing yeah uh, but some are having the mindset of like uh, having an accent is something like little high and uh, that is something that's the attitude absurd, problem no? that's the attitude that problem that is attitude problem yeah i agree yeah. with you thank you madam yes. no problem and most of the non natives think that they speak in british english or american english even in sri lanka even though we speak uh, sri lankan english that is very interesting some people do not want to believe it too right they say may come to argue you know how can you say so i speak in british english my accent is like that they just come to a you know kind of a self conclusion self um, you know like um, they try to show off in a way but sometimes it's a misconception misconception right it's a myth right so but they do not know that it's a myth okay so they believe that they have they speak in this particular variety which is not true most of the time okay so mitigating strategies of linguistic shame and shaming in a nutshell so th these are some of the mitigation strategies that my participants were commenting on uh, through professional learning programs right they can mitigate strategies of linguistic shame and shaming for example the american center the british council they have different teach education programs they have partnership programs they conduct different uh, professional learning programs where they teach different techniques for teachers to utilize employ in practical classrooms to counter these practices okay and so as esl practitioners it's your duty not to miss these opportunities because we have heard enough stories of teachers not participating actively in teacher development programs the cpds continuous professional development programs so their knowledge the skills they become very stagnated right they never attend these programs but if they are given an opportunity to, to fly to another country they would always do that but if they are located in a rural place and if they are asked to come for a training program in colombo they have thousands of excuses okay so you cannot be like that whatever the opportunity is given to you you have to grasp it and a lot of self studying has to be done has to be uh, done too okay so professional learning programs you have to participate teach education programs and partnership programs there are different webinars uh, uh, organized by the british council american center i know it very well there are very good programs very good platforms for most of them uh, i don't think you have to pay especially they are on zoom now readily available and go use these materials okay use these resources efficiently and state sponsored programs so such programs you can learn different techniques of mitigating these types of inhibitions in the classroom and pedagogical responses so that is something that you find out your own technique your own strategy to counter this program for example um you can have your own teaching styles you can have your own teaching uh, strategies to make the students confident okay for example there was this one teacher who used um uh, arm bonds you know what an arm arm bond is arm bond is something like you know like different gestures we use are pahagda not yet so likewise you give like you give 5 10 and then you have different you know like giving um shaking the hand or different movements of the hand using the hand in different ways so as a way of uh, making the child quite confident in uh, using the language so the teacher gives an arm bond if the student speaks at least three sentences during the english period in the classroom so the student knows that the teacher is not ready to shame the person and the student knows the other students the fellow peers are not laughing at them at him so whenever to get an arm bond he or she tries to speak in english so it is a very small technique but very unique you can try these things in the classroom so so the teacher gives an arm bond at the end during the lesson if one student speaks more than three sentences in english totally it could be a very simple sentence but to get the arm bond from the teacher and the teacher giving an arm bond is a sign 
of teacher appreciating the student for speaking in english so to get that and to get that recognition in the class the students try to speak in english okay and also we have we always we have we all have experienced this one having a tilt in the class right so if you speak a singhala word during the english period if you speak a tamil word during the english period we have to put some money into that as a penalty as penalty as a fine okay so that is something so we all can develop our own unique little strategies to encourage them to speak in english so the shame triggers the shame makers will no longer be recognized in the classroom so they won't ask ah we are if i say something in english they won't ask is it, is it something eatable is it something edible udeta kala dinne that is how they ask right that is how they humiliate if somebody at least speaks a single word of english so you shouldn't have that kind of an atmosphere in the classroom or you shouldn't encourage such uh, you know cut the sort of a thing in the classroom that sort of an attitude would you know tremendously put things down and aggravate things in linguistic shame and shaming in the classrooms and communicative activities so you can always include communicative activities into even into a reading lesson even into a writing lesson you could base your lesson um, in a communicative way right so you know that in sri lanka eclectic method is encouraged so there is no particular method that we have to use uh, when you teach english in the textbooks in the teachers guide they have said us to use eclectic method it's a melange it's a mixture of mixed method okay but using that method you can give some sort of a priority to the communicative activities that is something and technology so tech you can now most of the students these days they are better than us in technology you know so they have access to wi what whatsapp facebook insta whatever the other social medias are okay so you can use social media in its good way so you can encourage them to record uh, some pronunciation activities and send them through whatsapp or viber so you can make use of this social media in a good way so that it because it gives some sort of an access right some sort of an exposure for them to see english to be with english so you can use these resources in a professional way and an ethical way so that they take some interest in learning english and using english fearlessly okay so use of technology is a good thing especially here uh, social media and uh, other technique you know like most of the schools now have language labs so you can always take them to the language lab and uh, things like uh, i have come in i think i have included it here <coughs> english as a life skill the last program english as a life skill program actually we i contributed to that a lot uh, to design it and to video you know like script writing and presenting english as a life skill program in sri lanka was a very brave move to um, let children and teachers feel that english is no longer a foreign language it's a part and parcel of us so it gives you very practical scenarios so episodes of people using sri lankan english for day to day language for da daily communication so they are by letting them watch these english as a life skill program series i think every school has it if you are an english teacher your school has it if not you can um, request a set of english as a life skill dvds from the ministry of education english department or else uh, from the national institute of education okay so then you can take the children to the language lab and make them watch these videos those are very interesting ones and um, a lot of hard work has been given to that language by all of us to um, you know like popularize english in the country so that people would start looking at english as a part of the country and part of our daily lives and use of sri lankan english even if they use sri lankan english pronunciation 100% even if they use um, even if you use a little bit of singhala to explain uh, during the english language that is fine okay so at least if it does some good on them and if it encourages them to speak english that is fine if not they would consider english as an alienated aspect alienated thing but if you just make them watch these videos and you know sri lankan english is something that we all are familiar with so they would probably take it in that way quite positively and confidence building 
use of shaming so i told you use of shaming in the proper way could also be an elimination strategy so if you think that there are shame makers in your class you can use shaming as a weapon as a mitigation strategy to shame them again and uh, counter shaming okay so that is also but that has to be done with care right and feedback literature um, da, da, da. and uh, literature and music learn from peers or co curricular activities so you can organize different co curricular activities such as um, uh, english literary associations or different you know meetings and different societies <coughs> by creating a platform for them to use english and literature and music so they admire literature they admire short stories let them watch movies <coughs> let them listen to songs so by these means give some access to english give some exposure and use these things um to uh, for your teaching mix these things into your teaching so that they will build their confidence <coughs> okay so this is basically the conclusion that i have discussed uh, i have summed up what we have uh, gone through so far and what these research findings are what sort of implications for policy making policy planning curriculum uh, writing material writing and uh, we gave interpretations we tried to understand what linguistic shame and shaming is and how to identify people with linguistic shame and shaming and what sort of things are suggested to mitigate these practices and the background story for linguistic shame and shaming and uh, how this study was done using semi semi structured interviews using different uh, participant groups to get their perceptions on uh, what linguistic shame and shaming is any questions ma'am even though uh, the yeah, even though we uh, like learn english from grade 3 here yeah, it's grade 3 i started learning english Yeah. to a levels yes this is uh, now i speak english right this is only my hard work i never got that platform in my school from my school okay because uh, my story is very different my name is virginia so all the pay, uh, kids uh, thought that my name is virginia it's uh, it's a english name so uh, everywhere i went why your name is virginia or a singer kata karana bhai sir Now, who gave you that name? So why, why, why you got that name? You just yeah. uh, forget about your name. That that made me uh, learn English. This is all my hard work. Till uh, grade thirteen, I never got that platform. Okay, uh, and uh, basically, even now, I'm not a teacher. But I'm just uh, learning. This is the uh, first course I'm doing. I just want to uh, know why we can't like make that environment in the school, even though they give that. Uh, the sound a good knowledge of grammar why can't they give that spoken knowledge like the 45 minutes is more than enough why we can like make that environment i i just want to know what because if i when i want to step when i step into a school first thing i want to make is to make them talk before even giving them the grammar knowledge i want to make them talk that is the most important thing eventually hmm. after that making them talk we can give them that the knowledge this is how you have to use the language these are the grammar this is the body this is how you have to follow it but i first thing we have to make them talk how we can do it that is the mo- i don't know why the government school is not giving that i have no idea okay right um do you want do you expect me to answer fully or do you want me and uh, prof angela both to answer yes i was just going to say that both vote okay. right i will just give you my opinion um well so the first and foremost thing is the sri lankan education system is highly examination based so it is exam oriented so based on that the teachers are struggling to cover the syllabus uh in the due you know by the due date and parents also go by the results so no matter whether the children sometimes speak or not they want a passes for all the subjects from more levels and four a's from a advanced level so that is that so the teachers have the burden of completing the curriculum completing the syllabus within one year so they have 45 minutes the cl- during in one class there are more than 40 students in a government school so the teachers can't give attention one to one attention to all 40 or 45 students and there's no enough room 
or space for them to do communicative activities or even to for example you know you know how the classrooms are in most of the schools especially i'm talking about the disadvantaged schools so you know like no proper partitions so because of that the other class is disturbed when they do a communicative activity in the other class so based on such the teachers have to answer the principal if there is a lot of noise from this class so they always avoid doing these speaking activities so listening music playing activities for listening and all they always what, what they want is to give students something to write and complete the grammar do grammar activities okay that is that teachers have to do some face saving techniques and principal also wants the results at the end of the day whether the speak to the students speak english or not what matters at the end of the day is public exam results that much exam oriented so that is that so the teachers cannot solve the issues from their end only because of these socio political issues that is one thing but if you are an innovative teacher no matter what the circumstance is it is up to you to creatively utilize the materials especially if you do not have sophisticated materials to use for communicative activities to let make them speak they can always use authentic materials that is something and now there is a discussion going on to make english as the medium of instruction so this has always been a discussion and in the parliament always one particular group of parliamentarians or one group of politicians who always go against such good policies always they contradict they always tell okay if the medium of instruction becomes english it will do injustice to the rural child so that is their point of view but my point is my question is if you do not do it right now when are we going to do it i know in i know by experience even to include an email writing uh, lesson into the textbook is very challenging when you make the syllabus so there you know there is a panel when you make syllabus when you make curriculum sometimes some people do not agree sometimes they think okay now what will happen to the rural child they have no access to internet they don't know how to write an email so if you include an email writing lesson into the textbook grade 10 and the urban ones will go for that they know they have internet they know all these things and they will go for that but what will happen to the rural child but if the teacher is innovative and if the teacher works for a rural school if the teacher no the teacher obviously knows what an email is and what internet is and teacher has the facilities to a great extent so the teacher can do something creatively and make this let the student know what an email is at least in their writing at least you know like she can do something using authentic materials so likewise always there are techniques so I, we cannot blame the government for encouraging this exam oriented system that is a big mistake that is true that is a big mistake in the system but at the same time it's up to the teacher and the student and all the other parties in this uh, game right the trainers so, um, the the in, in service advisors i iss okay and the the regional english support centers are there zonal english support centers are there resc zesc staff they all these people are there they are well qualified ones but the teachers should go to them get support right get their qualifications done and not to because the most of the teachers they only teach grammar because that is how they have been taught okay so they have attended rural schools and that is how their teachers have taught them so they don't know any other way to teach it any other way, way to do a good lesson so they just you know do the same thing reinventing the same wheel like they do the same thing so this has been the practice for the last couple of uh, you know decades that is where we have gone wrong and if the teacher is very brave and if she adopts a different uh, communicative approach and you know she make this there are schools right there's one school in kurunagala and we have heard stories and even i have visited these schools where the the english teacher makes all the students speak english the assembly is done in english every day very rural schools but all the students speak in english so that is the credit should go to the teacher right that teacher starts school at 5 am so he asked the students to come at 5 o'clock in the morning so 5 to 7 o'clock or 7 36 or something so they have english they have lessons i have witnessed it i have seen it in my own eyes because uh, they are capable grade 5 6 children 
they are capable of doing you know panel discussions and you know everything in english the english is not perfect that is something else we do not speak perfect english anyway because you know it, it it's a myth so that is how the teachers also put their effort into this into this business and see the tuition masters so why you now even teach you tuition classes sometimes the english sometimes english is taught in singhala but at the end of the day what they want the result a a mark a grade from the exam if one teacher is you know giving so much of priority to one communicative activities and do all that if she does all that so if the, at the end of the day if the results go down because the children do not know grammar the exam oriented paper is always on grammar and writing and reading they do not assess the children speaking and listening in public exams in sri lanka in government schools so what is the point that is how the teachers think that is how the parents think so the teachers have a trouble here they can be doing all the communicative activities but then they won't have time to do the grammar and other reading from which the students will be tested at the exams so the whole problem is very very complicated and it's a dilemma so even this think practical issues like linguistic shame and shaming and many other you know personal and contextual issues if we cannot address them today in future also we will we will not be able to solve any of these uh, issues that we have in the language elt industry in the country so it's up to all these parties to sort it out together as a team not that we should always blame the government not that we always blame the student or the teacher everyone is pressurized in different ways the teachers wages salaries are low so the teachers have no interest in doing the work uh, you know so uh, more than the salary right so th those are practical issues so they just do sometimes there are very good teachers but some teachers might they, they are just you know they are i mean they are not that interested they are burnt out okay so they have run out of the energy they just do something uh, by practice they just go to it okay turn to page 20 we are going to do this lesson read the lesson and uh, that's the approach so the problem is quite vast and as you said i accept what you say but you know if you go depth into the matter there are things that we all have to do individually but we have not done so yet yeah then the end of the day that speaking is what matters right when we go to an interview we we'll, as you said yeah, when we yeah, go to the yeah, yeah. Uh, when we go to the university spoken is what yeah. matters yeah for example you can do buddhism you can do christian studies you can do singhala you can do any other let's say something history any other good subject in the university but it's up to you to polish your english too and if not you will always have to teach the same subject in singhala or tamil medium and that's it i so wish i way, you can't be yes. blaming others saying yeah. that they are doing better jobs i got a first class she got a second uh, upper but she did english as a major i did history as a major i did no, i do not have a good job but she has a better job so they can't be going to the you know this um, somewhere and go on all these strikes and uh, manifestations saying that uh, i am a graduate and i do not have a job because you do not have a job because you did not polish the skills that you wanted to polish when you were there as a student so then you can't blame the government okay it's so it's up to you as well you could be you could have studied in an urban school but after coming to the university you have english programs if you cut it if you if you do not attend lectures then that's your problem end of the day you can't be blaming the lecturers and the government for not offering you a good job because you do not have english you have no job that's a that's the thing in the country in most parts at least okay, yeah, so that's that's great yeah. everybody's duty to fix this up soon yeah prof angela you you have a say any any thing to say um well obviously i i can't speak to the sri lankan context specifically um but as somebody who gets second language students from every continent except antarctica of course um absolutely virginia you are correct uh, so is dr ashini the issue is supremely complex um unfortunately it absolutely though is heavily influenced like dr ashini said um with the state exams and the expectations of the schools and the grades 
So for example, um, yes, my South Asian students, all of those exams are very, very grammar translation, very written based. So we get students um, who are testing at an IELTS 5.5 or 6 for reading and writing, but they're testing at an IELTS 3 for listening and speaking. Or they're at a 4 for speaking and a, or a 4 for listening, 3 for speaking. Um, so which causes us issues because then what level do we place them in? There's this huge gap and at a North American educational setting, while we do require reading and writing, we also require academic presentations. We require seminar courses and discussions. So yes, and then in the Middle East, their curriculum is very, very oral. So we get Middle Eastern students who are testing at an IELTS 6.57 for listening speaking, and they're at an IELTS 3 for reading and writing because the expectations in the Middle East and that educational system are very oral based. So unless you're integrating and or using all the skills, there will absolutely be a divide. And you're correct, Virginia, it's if you want them to speak, they have to speak. Thank you so much, Professor Angela and Dr. Hashini for connecting from two stretched ends of the world. <laughs> Professor Angela had to write very early in the morning. Dr. Hashini has been having a very taxing week. She has been relocating. <laughs> <laughs> right. it, and it's a Sunday and both of you could have been sleeping soundly right now, but <laughs> instead you agreed to show up and we wholeheartedly thank you for that. Both of you are overflowing pots of knowledge and today's event was immensely resourceful. I took some notes myself because I'm a student and I found this very resourceful too. So thank you from me. Also, much thanks to all the staff members of St. George Teacher Training Institute for organizing this. It was very valuable. And also thank you for ensuring that it happened until the last moment. I'm sure everyone now has an edge when it comes to facing linguistic challenges. You guys were very uh, forward thinking. Most of you shared your insights. Most of you asked great questions and it was a very collaborative session. So thanks for that. And thanks for joining and sticking along with us until 6 p.m. So that's that ends everything. As always, stay safe and have a pleasant evening and a pleasant morning to Professor Angela. Thank you. Michelle, thank you so much. And thank you everyone, St. George staff, Ms. Rashanta and everyone, Ms. Nilanti and everybody else and all the participants. So we had a very fruitful session. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for your I cooperation. Agree. Very Thank interesting. You. I hope you all learned something. I did. So it's great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank See you. you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.